So one of the things that I really set out to do was uh, with Dark Matter was that really I, I learned in, in Stargate uh, SG-1 and writing Stargate Atlantis was that, you know, viewers will tune in for the hook, but they will stay for the characters. Mm. And humor is, is a shorthand that allows audiences to connect with these characters. And so that's what was very important about Dark Matter. So in this dark, dark world, there is very much the light of these characters. I would love to get back into space again, uh, but far future sci-fi is tough. Mm. It's a tough sell. I suppose it's quite tough after uh, shows like The Expanse, where you know even 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 the popularity of The Expanse didn't save it from being initially cancelled. Right. Um, right. Yeah. I mean, and, and a show like The Expanse, uh, Altered Carbon, were very expensive to produce, mm. and so you know, the commissioning executives will look at that and say, okay, we could spend all this money on this show and get these ratings, or we could spend half that and get, you know, ratings very similar. Hmm. You know, what what are we going to do? Attention all citizens of the future. Buckle up and step into our time tunnel of imagination to join us on an extraordinary journey into the days of futures past. From the fantastical tales of Jules Verne and Isaac Asimov to Buck Rogers and the famous visions of the World's Fair, the future might not be evenly distributed, but it sure ain't what it used to be. So let's go to our guide that excavator of the eventual, that historian of the hereafter, that recorder of retro futures, Theo Priestley. Hello and welcome to another episode of Days of Futures Past, where I get to chat with a special guest around science fiction and what kind of visions of the future inspired them as children. Today's guest is Joseph Malozzi, who is a showrunner, executive producer and writer for shows which you may have seen if you're a sci-fi buff, Dark Matter, Stargate SG-1, Stargate Atlantis and Stargate Universe. Joe, how are you? I am well. How are you? I'm good, thanks. I'm good. I've been looking forward to this. Now, one of the burning questions I have in my mind is why Baron Destructo is a Twitter handle? You know, <laughs> growing up, I was always a big fan of villains, super villains, which is reflected in my, you know, I do a, uh, a feature where I, uh, on, on Twitter on this day in super villain history. But as far back as when I was a kid, you know, I was always a fan of the villains. They're always so more, more colorful. You know, especially like the James Bond villains. I would always, mm. you know, whenever they would catch with James Bond, I'd always be like, you know, kill him. Don't don't set these elaborate traps. You're, you know, they're really going to blow up in your face. And invariably they did. And, uh, you know, Bond got to uh, live another day. <laughs> you also do something on, on Twitter, which is uh, around spaceships. So you literally dig up four ships and you have been doing this for quite a while. I think, you think you're up to 280, something like that now? Well, actually, well, 200 almost like 280 posts for mm. ships per post. So well over a thousand ships. Uh, now, yeah, originally, um, I think I did, I, I, I decided I would do maybe a round of 16 because I wanted to do kind of have a uh, tournament where, you know, the ships would face off. And then I said, no, maybe I'll, I'll go to 32. And then I said, no, I'll go to the 64. Then I'll like, maybe like an even hundred. <laughs> and, uh, and uh, you know, I think, I'm I'm a little over a thousand. I'm sure now. Originally, I was going to stop at um, I think two fifty, but I realized that a couple of them were you know airships, and I may have repeated a few. So just to be on the safe side, I think I'm going to go to three hundred and then call it uh, a thread. Right. And how do you dig them all up? Because I mean, you know, people's. I think people's imaginations kind of sort of stop at the usual tropes or certainly the more popular science fi But I've seen some weird and wonderful stuff in, in, in things that even I can't remember, uh, you know, watching as a kid. Yeah, I'll be honest with you. It's very, uh, it was a lot easier in the early goings and people would say, <laughs> you know, these are just layups. These are, you know, the, the Romulan Warbird or, or the Enterprise, the original Enterprise. But as you go on, you have to be a little more, um, uh, I guess, you dig a little deeper and so i'm looking into the world of anime and, and the world of gaming and uh and maybe some of the lesser known uh sci-fi shows out of like germany from the 50s for instance uh you know their old uh, uh uh films from the the you know the 40s and 50s uh 
So, you know, it's been a lot of fun, actually, actually, even more so now, actually digging up some of the lesser known ships. Mm. Do you have a favorite or have you come across a favorite yet? Hard to choose a favorite. I mean, I mentioned the Romulan Warbird just mm. because I've always loved it. Um, and I love the, the, the redesign as well. Um, you know, the, uh, in, in terms of recent ships, uh, maybe I'm somewhat biased, but I love the Raza for my own show, Dark Matter, <laughs> that I describe as a little bulldog. Uh, I describe as a little bulldog to the design team, and, and they came through in a, in a big way. Uh, and of course, I mean, the Enterprise, mm. classic. Yeah, it's a classic shape. So, I mean, it's What's that so Lex ship, by the way? The Lex ship that looks like a dragonfly. I never watched the show, but, but the, 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 that ship stands out. I think um, one of them that stands out for me are the, um, the ships in Babylon 5, because they always yeah. felt very organic um, and very different. I mean, the human ships were always very, you know, it's got wings, it's got engines and things like that, and ever, yeah. very recognisable, whereas um, yeah. the shadows were very spidery-like and, you know, very menacing and the, classic and the villains Borland there. Was squid-like, squid-like, mm. yeah. Yes, I think it, yes, absolutely. I wonder if they took cues from, like, Chris Foss, because he was very into... into fish type designs in in a lot of mm -hmm, his um, mm -hmm. depictions and things like that so possibly yes yeah so some of so you've you do filmmaking and obviously series and then you're a showrunner i mean how how has that been changing over the last sort of you know couple of years two, two three four years now especially with the writer strike and now we've got ai coming into the mix and things like that i mean do you see that as a, a fundamental shift in how writing and producing is going to impact the industry you know it's really hard to say because with any other technology you predict how you assume it's going to turn out it never really quite turns out the way you mm. you predicted and you know on the one hand you have people who think ai will be a wonderful uh writer's assistant in terms of assisting with research or, or uh, you know or or you know facilitating you know, structural mechanics. On the other hand, you have um, kind of more dire uh, prediction where you see uh, um, studios using AI to write scripts. Hmm. And in my mind, maybe in the not too distant futures, AI will be able to write perfectly average scripts uh, though, to be fair, I think those perfectly av average scripts will be indistinguishable from 70% of the production <laughs> that is that put out today. But I think talented writers, uh, ta uh, writers who, who are able to write nuanced scripts, especially scripts with a sense of humor, because I, I'm not convinced AI hmm. will come close to being able to pull off humor. I think, I think those writers, the talented writers, will always find work. I th uh, on, on the humorous point, um, I have actually used ChatGPT to try and test what it can do. I mean, I've seen a lot of, um, not script writers, but a lot of uh, creative writers and copywriters trying to sort of challenge it to write clever copy for um, yeah. advertising and things like that. And and I do find it lacking. Uh, even if you mm. give it a prompt, a very you know sophisticated prompt. And I think yeah. a lot of the time, what I've found is you spend more time trying to craft a prompt to make it do something right and less and and in that time you could have actually written the thing yourself yes you're better served doing it yourself yeah. yes yeah. so i mean exactly i feel as though um the doomsayers are are way off right now hmm. i think we still have a ways to go so you grew up in the 60s i believe yeah, I, I was born in 65 and I grew up really up in, in the 70s. Yeah. What yeah. was it like in, in that time as a kid, you know, especially especially in the, where you are now in terms of dreaming up science fiction and world building and things like that? I mean, was there, were there things in there that kind of impacted you as a child? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I grew up, I was always, I was always been, I have always been a very voracious reader, uh, much to my mother's delight. But really my first love was comic books. Uh, much to my mother's chagrin, which is why she ended up gifting me all these sci-fi novels. But, you know, I look back to to one of my favorite comic books growing up was A Legion of Superheroes. And that was a very retro future feel. 
uh, you know, kind of the style styles of the 1950s mm. uh, reimagined for a, I think it's a 30th century. And in many ways, it reminded me of Star Trek, which was another, sh- you know, a show that that I grew up with. I mean, I, when I mean, I think it was produced in the in the, in the late sixties. Yeah, sixties. By the time, six, you know, I think, yeah, yeah, I think I think by the time I discovered it, uh, it had already been canceled. But very much like the Legion of Superheroes, it reflected a a future that was very diverse and hopeful. Um, and at the same time, I grew up in the shadow of the Cold War, really, mm. where the threat of a uh, nuclear Armageddon kind of loomed large. And so I was drawn to to movies like Planet of the Apes, for instance, which presents a somewhat darker view of the future. And I think the second movie, uh, we discovered the mutants beneath the surface who were actually worshiping an actual nuke. So that was kind of very interesting. I mean, I think back to like the, uh, um, you know, I, I, it was past my time, but kind of the duck and cover mentality of the 50s where everybody assumed, you know, the, the nuclear war could happen mm. any day and, and people had to be prepared. Um, but in the in the 70s, it kind of the notion of mutual assured, dis, uh, mutual assured destruction was still very much uh, a thing and really informed a lot of the... Um, a lot of the entertainment at the time, and which resulted in I think, kind of a lot of darker entertainment. Um, you know, I mentioned dark, uh, uh, Planet of the Apes, and on the surface, it may not seem that dark, but I, I look at movies like uh, uh, Logan's Run, hmm. which really didn't really uh, deal with uh, uh, the you know uh, the nuclear question, but really presented a a uh, kind of an interesting authoritarian. Uh, view of the future that kind of sort of took a look at um i think one of the big issues in the late 60s and 70s was kind of this idea of the population explosion the population mm. bomb and uh logan's run on a very interesting way to to address the issue uh whereas you have something like clockwork orange which i think was also 70s yeah i think, I think so early 70s and that movie is as topical today as it was back then and its treatment of uh, just kind of this notion of violence and how um, really it 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 becomes almost uh, celebrated in our society. Um, you know, I mean, I remember watching Clark Park Orange for the first time, and you're kind of rooting for Alex in kind of a dark way, uh, <laughs> and his droogs. Uh, and and you, you know, if a, you imagine what that was like back then and kind of the, the way the characters celebrated their violence. And today with, um, you know, social media, you know, especially Twitter and Facebook, where, you know, you see these kind of vi- videos go viral of, of, of fights and, and, and lootings. And, uh, and then on the other hand, you have the authoritarian response to uh, these violent acts, which again kind of reflects you know, the, the, the world of, uh, of Clockwork Orange. So, I mean, it's very interesting sort of looking back at, at kind of what influenced me, what I love to read, what I love to write, and how um, really a lot of it has kind of come to fruition kind of a strange way. Yeah, in a roundabout way, in a, in a sense, yeah. yeah. I mean, uh, do you remember, um, so what, one of the earliest science fiction films that, that, that I can remember and certainly impacted me quite hard was um silent running with bruce Dern, mm-hmm. yeah and obviously you had huey dewey and louie the, the the three robots and and joan baez's track at the end just kills me every time yeah um yeah. but i think from that from that you know you, you're talking about sort of logan's run then it was painting mm-hmm. society in a completely different way and then you have um planet of the apes again post-nuclear society but now with apes and then you have silent running which is almost like an ecological where we are today with climate change and, and things like mm. that which is like it was an eco- ecological society that was well the, the ecology was collapsed and the only and the only way to save it was to you know to be essentially put you know the the ecology in space and and hope that some at some point we would be able to return to earth and and save it and of course the you know we find out midway through the the, the movie that um you know, Bruce has to uh, blow it up because there's no coming back from it. Mm-hmm. Kind of all messed up. Um, I mean, do you always find that writing science fiction the way you have for for Dark Matter and Stargate, you, you 
science fiction needs that conflict and needs that kind of sort of darker edge to keep people entertained? Um, I can, yes and no. I mean, if I take an example, uh, Dark Matter, for instance, it's set in a pretty dark future where these multinational corporations have sort of grown in power, <laughs> have gone off and seeded worlds that they exploit. And against this backdrop, we have our villains who, um, you know, at the end of the first season, at the end of the first episode, they realize that they're the worst of the worst uh, villains, and yet they have no memories of their past. And so the entire, obviously, the, se the series is about uh, this battle, uh, this internal battle they face about, you know, uh, between their, the, the past and their future. Um, and so what I, yeah, Dark Matter, I, I think, perfectly encapsulates that kind of the, the dichotomy of the hopeful sci-fi of, let's say, the Legion of Superheroes and Star Trek that I grew up with on one hand, and the kind of the darker Clockwork Orange, Logan's Run, uh, Planet of the Apes, um, kind of almost like dystopian uh, future, mm -hmm. uh, in that the, in kind of the backdrop is very dark, but the characters were the heart of the story um, are very burn very brightly. And there's a sense of humor uh, ingrained kind of in all their characters. One of the things that I really set out to do was uh, with Dark Matter was that really I, I learned in, in Stargate uh, SG-1 and writing Stargate Atlantis was that, you know, viewers will tune in for the hook, but they will stay for the characters. Mm. And humor is, is a shorthand that allows audiences to connect with these characters. And so that's what was very important about Dark Matter. So in this dark, dark world, there is very much the light of these characters. And, um, you know, again, the books I read, uh, the movies I saw, really influenced my writing. I mean, another one off the top of my head, of course, is Ray Bradbury. And kind of the perfect example of that was um, The Illustrated Man uh, and, and kind of the stories in that book, like one of the, one of the, the first stories uh, that kicks it off, The Velth, I, I think it was, and it's about these parents who get their kids a, a VR room uh, and they imagine kind of, I think like, what, what is the, the, you know, the, the jungle and uh, the, the parents are kind of weirded out and they're like, okay, you know, you're going to have to like, you know, uh, uh, we're going to shut it down. You're spending too much time, uh, you know, uh, in this VR room, which really reflects, you know, today where parents are like, oh, you're spending too much time gaming. You got to get out more. <laughs> and then, you know, in the end, actually the, the, the VR turns out all too real when the kids end up trapping their parents in the jungle and, and the lions come for them. And it's uh, it's kind of a uh, you know dark but darkly humorous story, uh, you know that that yeah in some ways kind of predicted uh, the, you know our obsession with uh, with uh, VR in a way which is gaming mm. this alternate worlds of entertainment. Do you um, so so do you tend to sort of navigate towards when you're reading science fiction and and obviously where where you came from in the past as a child do you you tend to gravitate towards more character driven stories or do you like the hard sci-fi more to be honest with you i really prefer more the character driven stories more than anything i really you know i i've always been a very avid reader um but i find that i truly enjoy maybe 20 to 25 percent of what i read mm. um the other uh, there's another 20 25 percent i think is just terrible which i don't mind reading because you realize it's terrible quite quickly and you can dismiss it. Whereas it's another 50% that is not quite good, but you kind of have pulled out hope for that right. never kind of pans out. That is the worst because you invest all that time. But I, you know, more than anything, I just want a story that makes sense. I want characters who make sense. I want to avoid contrivances and conveniences. I mean, it's just kind of the, you know, what I as, as a writer um, will look to in my own writing. Um, so, you know, I, I, find, I, I find the hard sci-fi interesting but somewhat dry hmm. um for the most part i mean there can be wonderful character driven uh hard sci-fi but um again I, I kind of gravitate to towards uh either books or television or films with a sense of humor they don't have to be comedies but something with that with an, an undercurrent of humor like you know the, the, the sopranos is a show that I'm going to be doing a rewatch of. It's one of my favorite shows. Um, again, the source material, you know, the, the world is very dark. But there are mm. flashes of humor in that that are just so memorable. So, you know, that's really what appeals to me. So I guess maybe there's a, that kind of a glimmer of hope in, you know, in 
in even the darkest of, of worlds that is something that that really appeals to me and is it more the sort of old old school um golden age of sci-fi the 50s 60s 70s stuff that you you tend to gravitate towards or do you prefer actually the more modern stuff now um again i i find the 50s and 60s uh visions maybe a little too um uh what's the word uh i mean it, it's you know it's it, it feels a little silly at mm. times uh whereas the darker stuff i mean it, it, it feels as though executives today seem to really embrace the darker sci-fi and that type of sci-fi doesn't resonate in general with fan with fandom mm. um i think you know i look at guardians of the galaxy or really again the original star trek or stargate or or the star wars shows um you know and they all again there was that sense of family at its core that sense of humor um and it was just not all dark 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 Hmm. and and that's what i think again you know farscape is another one another great example that's what resonates with fandom and yeah i guess sooner or later the executives will figure it out which point maybe the fans will move on to something else. I don't know, but uh, <laughs> uh, there you have it. Do you, so when when you look back as well, and, and you had the fifties atomic age, for example, and you had mm. everything was atomic powered, and you know even cars were atomic powered. I think uh, one of the previous guests mentioned Asimov and his atomic ashtrays and things like that. I mean, it's, right. you know, they science fiction back then kind of imagined worlds that wasn't constrained by particular technology. So I guess mm-hmm. I, I, I can understand your point about in terms of some of it was quite silly because they didn't understand what technology could do. And so they just dreamt and went wild. I mean, do you miss that kind of thing? Or or do you miss that in sci-fi where, uh, to me, it feels like we know what technology is capable of and so therefore we can't think beyond that because we've now been rooted in it for so long? Um, yeah, I mean... I mean, certainly back then, what, you know, their their visions of the future, I'm sure were not deemed quite as silly as they are now in, in retrospect. But I mean, I think it's the same way today. Um, you know, I, I, I look at, um, for instance, in Dark Matter, uh, we use something called tran- transfer transit, which is something that is, you know, is technology, a sci-fi technology that is not unique to dark matter you know i just thought the way it was using dark matter was kind of unique the idea that essentially you you step into a a um a pod and your consciousness consciousness is trans is uh transferred into a clone that you know whatever million millions of miles away that is created for you and so essentially it's a way you know to travel um you know faster than light uh and and in essentially the clone experiences everything and then goes back to to its original to, to the pod and the put the the clone is destroyed but the memories are relayed back to the original traveler um so i mean something like that uh i think is kind of very interesting this idea of, of, of uh, uh kind of the memory transfer or or you know cloning um that you know maybe 10 years from now is going to be laughable or maybe even now is a little silly. Mm. Uh, but you know, I, th- I think it is, it, it, even though technology is, is, you know, developing incredibly rapidly, it's, you know, you still are able to envision potential, you know, uh, breakthroughs and, 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 you know, different ways of life that, um, um, you know, makes use of today's technology but imagines it like you know extrapolates like 10 or 100 fold what you know what's this evolution could be hmm. uh, uh, your um your sort of transport conundrum actually is quite interesting because it's a little bit different from obviously the star trek one which we know um but it still has that kind of sort of ethical side of things where obviously in star trek you're destroying the original and uh-huh. you're creating a copy Whereas mm-hmm. in your in your in Dark Matter's world, you're transferring the consciousness into a clone, but you're destroying the clone. Right. Now both of them still have ethical considerations here because what about the poor clone? Exactly. Yes. That's. <laughs> uh, yeah. Yeah. Um, so, 
talking going back to sort of the, the character driven stuff i mean you mm-hmm. do you have like a a favorite character that you've written for in each of the different science fiction shows that you've written uh again i always love the characters with the sense of humor one character that i really enjoyed writing for that i wrote for a bit in sg1 and a lot in atlantis was the character of richard woolsey played by uh robert picardo and he was an interesting character and you know i mean, I, I talk about my love of villains and and you know, there's always saying everyone's a uh, the hero in their own story, and I'm sure it's the mm. same way for for Doctor Doom. Uh, but you took uh, a character like Woolsey, who he's, in, he's introduced as a uh, kind of a pencil pusher, a bureaucrat, and then you know, as his appearances progress, you you know, you realize that you know he's 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 a man of ethics, even though he's kind of a pain in the ass. Uh, he's loyal, you know, he 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 fights for what he believes in. And uh, and ultimately, in time, we we rehabilitated him, uh, certainly in the eyes of the audience, and he you know became commander of the, the uh, Atlantis expedition. Again, a lot of it had to do with a sense of humor, where you know through humor we explore the character's uh, foibles, his weaknesses, and he becomes kind of endearing. And even though his personality doesn't really change, you understand who he is. And so mm. you know, I very much like those transformations, and that the, the character doesn't really transform so much as your understanding of the character transforms another example is mckay who is so incredibly annoying his first few appearances in sg1 and you hate him <laughs> and uh you know we, i remember we were casting atlantis we couldn't find a character um a, a, a an appropriate actor for this dr benjamin character and we're running out of time and then robert cooper is like well, why don't we bring mckay into atlantis and i was like oh my god that character is so annoying and yet <laughs> He became a fan favorite. <laughs> so, you know, I mean, as you peel the onions on these characters, their backstories, and again, again, you, if you realize it through humor, Dark Matter was another example. Dark Matter, uh, the character of Three, played by Anthony Lemke, who's kind of this, uh, you know, kind of this rogue gunslinger, we introduce. And, and one of the things about Dark Matter is all the characters have their memories wiped. So in a sense, they're kind of ciphers. Um, uh, you know, almost kind of like cliches when you first introduce them. And, and when he was first introduced in the first episode, everyone was like, oh, he's just the Jane character from Firefly. Mm. Uh, and everybody hated him, like universally. I mean, I, I remember going online and reading and everybody hated him. And I remember saying to Anthony, I think I've made a terrible mistake, but he actually had gone ahead and read all the scripts for the first season. And he was like, no, I know what you have in store for this character. This is going to be great. And one of the, I think one of the greatest things you can do for a character and for an audience is to surprise them and mm. to subvert their expectations. And that's what the Dark Matter was all about, I, in introducing the sci-fi chestnut and subverting it. So in the case of Three, he was a character you hated at first. And yet, by the end of the third season, and you know, the, the, uh, sci-fi would do these like audience uh, uh, questionnaires. And he and Android were the two most popular characters. And kind of, we rehabilitated him. And, and you know, I, I kind of love that challenge of taking a character that you hate and and turning him into a character you love, which is, you know, uh, reminds me of where you, when I was uh, in a psychology class in in, um, in college and our, our uh, professor telling us that, um, you know, uh, they have found that uh, friends make the worst of enemies, whereas uh, uh, enemies always turn out, end up me- making the best of friends because you kind of go through that journey with them. Hmm. And, you know, it's reflected in shows like, um, you know, Sopranos, again, I go back to that, is a character who, you know, Tony, Tony Soprano, uh, who is this heinous character, this gangster, and yet you go to love. And the flip side of that is is Breaking Bad. Uh, Walter White, who's this poor chemistry teacher <laughs> with cancer you feel sorry for, who you grow to hate. Uh, and so I love those, uh, you know, those transformations. And anytime you, can, anytime you can do that over time, it's just so incredibly satisfying. Is there, a, is there a character that you wish you had been able to write for in another TV show? Uh, you know what? I'm a big fan of the crime shows. Mm-hmm. So, um, <clears throat> you know, very much, uh, you know, I, 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 uh, I, I love the Tony Soprano character also being Italian. Uh, that character spoke to me. Um, I very much like that character. Looking back at some of the, like, I'm, I'm doing a crime binge and I'm about 150 shows into this crime but just watching shows crime shows that i haven't watched before shows from um uh different countries as a show i just finished watching called fairy which is a uh 
a um, spinoff of a series called Undercover, which is a Belgium show. He is also a gangster, fantastic character uh, who, again, you end up loving. Um, you know, I, I look at shows like Line of Duty or uh, out of out of uh, UK or Love Hate is another one. Shows that I discovered and you know, just interesting, flawed characters who take you on a journey. Um, you know, again, those are the characters I appeal and I, I would love to write for. Have you seen the latest True Detective uh, with I've got Jodie to tell Foster? You, I, I'll be honest with you. I got off the True Detective uh, train after season one. I really loved the first, uh, I absolutely the penultimate episode I really loved. I was really looking forward to the finale. And then I went online. I was like, how are they going to tie this up? And I read these fan theories and they were so brilliant. And I thought if this show can, you know, deliver even like 70% of what these fans have put together, mm. it's going to be amazing. Mm. And I watched that finale and I was just floored and not in a good way. I did. I, <laughs> I had like no idea. And then I heard the second season was not that good. And the third season was somewhat better than the, then, uh, and so I just, I just, I, there are just so many shows to watch mm. that, that it, if a show really lets you down, um, it's really hard to continue. So, I mean, I heard good things about the fifth season, but then again, I, I, I hear that there's a supernatural angle and I'm not a big fan of, of, uh, kind of the, when it comes to crime, kind of the cross genre crime shows. So, you know, I, I, I won't really watch, uh, sci-fi crime show or a horror crime show and a true detective from what i hear is kind of a supernatural uh crime show for its fifth season um i can I, I guess the issue with, with crime is uh, with supernatural is the issue i have with magic uh which is why i avoid you know i'm not i, I like grim dark fantasy but i steer clear of magic magical realism just because at the end of the day there are no rules mm. or rarely are there rules and, um, you know, you find yourself asking yourself, well, why doesn't Gandalf just teleport them out of the cave? And he's like, oh, he doesn't know that spell. Oh, well, isn't that convenient? He doesn't know that spell. <laughs> you know, that's how I feel whenever I watch like a magic based show or a supernatural show. And unless the rules, you know, there, there, you know, there are rules and, and the characters operate within that framework of the firmly established rules, I can kind of get on board. But more often than not, there are no rules and, and, and uh, you know, it just becomes, it feels very contrived. So I have to ask you, how are you enjoying season five of uh, Detective? Uh, well, it's funny because I haven't actually watched any of the others. So I have no knowledge of it other than um, mm. this one was had Jodie Foster in it and it's mm. in the Arctic. Yeah. Um, I've watched the first two and it does mm -hmm. have, it does have a science fiction, um, uh, science fiction, uh, um, supernatural slant to it. Mm -hmm. Um how it's going to pan out, I don't know. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I'm not going to spoil it for anyone who's going to watch and, and listen to this, but um, or, or yourself, obviously. But mm -hmm. I, I, yeah, I think you would need to watch the first two episodes to see if you're actually going to enjoy it. I mean, it does. Right. I, I think it's playing on the supernatural angle, but it's going to be couched in science. Um, well, that that's okay. <clears throat> I mean, I, I find that fine where essentially you, you present something as supernatural and then you know, you end up having a, a more or less a, a logical explanation for what's going on. Again, I mean, it all comes down to the endings for me, right? Mm. Setups and payoffs. Um, I remember one show that was very popular years ago, I won't name, that I was actually watching. Um, and there were so many twists and turns and clues. And, and then it became apparent they started to contradict themselves. And I realized the writers are just making it up as they go along. And... It just feels like such a betrayal. Hmm. And I think really the best type of storytelling, which is why I kind of gravitate to crime shows, uh, it, you know, is the type of storytelling where, where essentially you, you, you envision a beginning, a middle, and an end. And you write your show in a way that uh, you, 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 know, you lay breadcrumbs for the viewer that are not so obvious that when they pay off, they surprise the viewer and yet they do they do so in in a satisfying way. Hmm. Um, so I mean, like books, I think I like twenty five percent of what I watch, um, uh, and so that's I think right now I'm about I think maybe thirty out of the one hundred and forty uh, or one hundred fifty shows I watched uh, for this crime, which did can I say I really really enjoyed. But uh, 
you know, getting there is half the fun, as they say. Yeah, that show what didn't have four letters in the title, did it? The uh, show that you were talking about. Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> I think I know the one you mean. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, that did. Yeah, that started mm. off strong, meandered in the middle, and then yeah, obviously yeah. the the last one. And it's funny because I, I mean, basically the fan theories come out, and it's like, oh, this is you know, you know, they're they're you know they're in purgatory. And then, and the writers are like, no, no, that's not it at all. That's no. <laughs> and then, you know, I'm sure like seasons there, they're like, oh, how are we going to end this thing? Yeah. What that fan theory we read uh, three years back? <laughs> Let's steal that. <laughs> um, so going back to your childhood and, and, a, uh, and a little bit here, um, obviously reading lots of science fiction, obviously reading comic books as well, you know, were there any particular technologies or visions of the future that you wish had come true and that you could be living through right now? Um, you know, going back to what we were talking about transfer transit, the idea of teleportation mm. uh, was always very appealing to me throughout my life as you're stuck in traffic, as you have to sort of board <laughs> a flight for LA. Uh, so yeah, teleportation and its various incarnations and comic books and, and, and stories was something that I always found very appealing that, uh, you know, in theory, I believe is possible, uh, but uh, practically is not yet. So that's, uh, that is a, a big one for me. Not like the, um, what is it, the, uh, the the little tubes that you can get in Futurama where you just look oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Those, uh, through a tube. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> not quite that. <laughs> yeah, what, what, another one I always kind of find interesting was, um, Kind of the foods of the future and you know in those kind mm. of retro future films or tv shows the few fool you know we kind of uh, did a gag about it on on stargate with the asgardian food where you know they're, they look like pellets or pills or oh here you go you're gonna have uh here's your 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 carrot soup and here's your you know the a pill is a roast beef and yet as someone who's a huge foodie who derives so much pleasure from the experience of eating <laughs> in retrospect it's so silly because as a kid you think, oh, that would be very cool. But in reality, nah, it would be incredibly disappointing. Yeah, I remember the the the, the brightly coloured food tubes in the original Star Trek, and then obviously my, it, it, it progressed to um, having replicators do it. Yeah, right. But then, yeah, but then it kind of reminds me of the sort of Willy Wonka, and you get like the chewing gum that's actually a full <laughs> yeah. full three course yeah. dinner or something like that. Exactly. Um, <laughs> Um, where uh, what are you working on just now then is uh, you know are you allowed to say uh yeah i mean right now i'm developing um so i always have at least eight to ten different projects in development in various stages of development um i'm about to sign a deal on two potential development projects which are uh, essentially uh one is a sci-fi both are really sci-fi one is more kind of a monster show um that is being they approach me and they they want me to write the pilot for them. So the mm. pilot script for them. So that's you know uh, work for hire, and I'm also working on pilots. And I mentioned I, I you know I'm a, I'm a big fan of the crime genre. So my last three pilot scripts have all been um, crime related. One is kind of a cozy uh, mystery. Another one is kind of an action adventure globe trotting series, and another one is kind of a more um, uh, darker equalizer series but again all three of them have the uh a sense of you under an underlying sense of humor one of them actually we're going to go out and pitch in march the other one is actually going out now and the third one i just sent to my to my agent um yeah and this business is so feast and famine you never know what's mm. going to land i think back to dark matter and and i remember there were two pilots in play one was dark matter and another one was a a, a crime show a crime pilot i had written and that one was on the short list of i think of three shows that were being considered by a network and we had a a, a fan i would say an executive who had shepherded the project and said things were looking very good this channel uh, this, you know broadcast really needed this type of show and in the meantime i heard that dark matter was dead and so i was getting all ready to you know start prep on this show and within uh, 24 hours, that show was dead and Dark Matter had been picked up. So, I mean, you you do never know, which is why mm. so it's so important to have all these balls in the air. It can be very tiresome, but um, you always have to be producing. You always have to be meeting people. You always have to be pitching. 
Uh, you always have to be considering pitches. Um, one show that I did uh, back in 2019, 2020 was a show called Utopia Falls, which was a show that really um, I was approached about. Uh, it was kind of a YA sci-fi series that envisions a, a kind of a, a, a dark future without, without music. Uh, it was created by a um, music video director, R.T. Thorne. And he pitched me the show. And I thought, oh, very interesting. Not something I would ever work on, but, you know, mm. good luck pitching it. And he ended up getting the show picked up. And he called me and he's like, I need a showrunner. And I thought he was asking me who to, 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 to recommend someone. I was like, I don't know who would be good for this. And he's like, you. I was like, oh, no, I, I'm sci-fi. I'm not hip hop. And he's like, I'm hip hop. You're sci-fi. And, and I, I remember going in to do the meeting. And um, it was one of those... Uh, situations where in my mind there were so many changes I would make to the show to make, for, for it to work for me that I don't think they would I thought they would never go for it and so I was mm. brutally honest in that meeting and I said you know this is everything that you need to change this is what you have to do and they ended up making me the offer um, so you know sometimes these things kind of fall into your lap when you least expect them uh, and you know if you're honest I mean it, it has happened with Another recent project, one of the projects I'm about to um, do a development deal on, I initially I passed, but the creator was apparently a fan of my work and said, well, why don't we just get in on a Zoom and discuss? And my wife was like, say something positive. And it, it wasn't a bad project. I just, it just was not for me. And there were certain elements that, that I thought were really, you know, important to the ingrained in the project that I would want to pull out or, or change completely. And so I was brutally honest with them. And I, and I told them, these elements don't work. You know, this is what I would do, and then they ended up making me the offer. So, you know, if 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 you're honest and and uh, you know, with people, I mean, the, you know, less learned, I guess. Mm -hmm. um, so, I mean, but yeah, you know, again, I mean, ideally, I would love one of my own shows to go. Uh, I would love to get back into space again, uh, but far future sci-fi is mm -hmm. it's a tough sell. I suppose it's quite tough after uh, shows like The Expanse, where you know even 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 the popularity of The Expanse didn't save it from being initially cancelled. Right, um, right, yeah. I mean, and, and a show like The Expanse, uh, Altered Carbon, were very expensive to produce, mm. and so you know the commissioning executives will look at that and say, okay, we could spend all this money on this show and get these ratings, or we could spend half that and get you know, ratings are very similar, hmm. you know, what, what are we going to do? Which is a shame because you now I think, you know, what makes sci-fi interesting is the different types of science fiction you can explore. I mean, dark, uh, Black Mirror does a great job of that. Hmm. I'm exploring a lot of like the near future variations of the near future. Um, you know, whereas the expanse, like I said, or, or or the Star Treks, you know, do a do you know explore the far future, which uh, I've always kind of found a little more appealing. But but you know, it's a little tougher sell for mm. executives and for just general audiences. I think you know that's why I think Black Mirror does very well. Your crime dramas do they have an element of uh, sci-fi in them, or is it just pure they crime? They do not. They are pure crime. Yeah, uh, it's, it's interesting because I've seen um, Alien Nation and I've seen Space Precinct mentioned oh. a couple of times, mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. and I'm just wondering, you know, that we haven't actually seen a sort of space sci-fi kind of crime drama um, for a long time. I don't think. Yeah, I mean, cross genre is tough. I, mean, I, I look. I remember we were we were working on um, on on Stargate, and we would. You know, check out what what else sci-fi had in development, and and I think mm. one show was a uh, a uh, kind of a sci-fi seen elsewhere, like a space station, space hospital. Uh, another one they wanted to do space lawyers, and and I think on the surface, you know, it's new, but on the other hand, why? What, that, mm. Another one, one of the questions, one of the big questions that executives always want you to answer is why? Why now? And in my head, whenever I you know I think back to that space lawyer show, I, I think why. Mm. Yeah, it's not exactly going to work the same way as Suits did, is it? Right, right. <laughs> um, Joe, I've really enjoyed this. Uh, where can people find out more about what you're doing? Uh, you can certainly find me on Twitter, Baron Destructor. You can check out my uh, 
on going uh, identify the following spaceship uh, <laughs> right for now. I've been posting outtakes and bloopers and deleted scenes from both Stargate and uh, Dark Matter. I should pin those. Uh, I may take a break from Twitter for a while. Uh, but you can always find me on my blog. I've been blogging mm. for, I think, almost 14 straight years daily um, over at josephpalazzi.com. And I'll cover everything from the crime shows I watch to the food I eat to, again, the shows I've worked on to my dogs. Um, so that's where you can find me. Last question, actually. A bit of a curveball for you. But yeah. if you had one, one piece of advice for script writing sci-fi, what would it be? Again, for me, it, it, it wouldn't really even even just hold it. It, w- it wouldn't be exclusive to sci-fi, but set up some payoffs uh, or avoid these the three C's more than anything. Contrivances, conveniences, coincidences. I don't mind mm. if they work against your protagonist, but if they help your protagonist, it's just lazy script, right? And just cross the board, that will turn me off faster than anything too. If I'm reading a script, I'll set it aside. If I'm reading a book, the same thing. If I'm watching a movie or TV show, I will stop watching if it's just, you know, it's just a, a, a hallmark of lazy, right? right. And, and also, if you're, if, if you're writing science fiction, maybe a more specific sci-fi, read, you know, as varied, um, uh, as much sci-fi as possible, as varied sci-fi. So read, read your hard sci-fi, read your near future sci-fi, watch your dark mirror, mirror, uh, watch uh you know maybe read your comic books uh just uh uh you know just open yourself up to a variety of different visions joe thanks very much for taking the time for uh, this podcast it's my been, pleasure thank you for having it. me no, for no having worries me. Um, that's it for another podcast of Days of Futures Past Uh, join me again next time when we will speak to another guest about science fiction and what inspired them as children bye for now this is Days of Futures Past signing off when we'll once again peel back the curtain on more lost futures stay tuned and remember the future may be here but the past never fades until next time Days of Futures Past was brought to you by Theo Priestley, keynote speaker, author, and retrofuturist. If you'd like to appear as a guest and reminisce about futures gone by, get in touch. I've been your radio host, Andrew Helbig. Goodbye for now.